So there are five primary movement patterns of the torso. This is, of course, without consulting any movements that involve the arms. We're also not going to be consulting any movement of stomach or the diaphragm in isolation. And we're also not going to be considering anything that would be considered unilateral. Uh, some, some people might break down, for example, like a, a, hip, a hip shift where, you know, you see that like runway model kind of exaggerated hip shift one at one at a time. Unilateral just means one side, right? I, I would say that it's not unilateral because as you push one hip forward, the other comes back. So I don't like to think of it that way. It really depends on the model. And when you uh, break down these systems even further, you can come come up with um, a small smaller um, segments of movement. Like for example, if um, I have my whole my whole back, right? There's the lower the the lower erectors, which keep my my uh, back neutral. But of course, I can collapse that the thoracic spine only, and then flex that, right? But we're going to be thinking bigger than that. So just think of the, the primary five or six, to, uh, depending on um, how you want to think of this. We'll get to that and you'll see what I'm talking about, right? So first we have flexion. Flexion is just bending over, right? If we were on the ground, we would be doing a crunch. Like this would be the equivalent of doing a uh, crunch or um, uh, a sit-up, right? But of course, when we're standing, uh, we're involving much more muscle systems than that because we're balanced on our feet. So we have all the stability of our lower leg, like the tibialis, the calf, the soleus. Um, because we're pushing back, we're using our, our butt, our glutes, um, our hamstrings. And because we have our knees bent a little bit and we're standing on them, we're using our quadriceps, right? As we can see that there's so many muscles involved. It's better to think of these in terms of movement patterns than um, uh, muscles, except for maybe the prime movers, the, the very uh, major muscle systems. The reason for that is twofold. One is that there's just so many. If I were to really break it down, there'd be hundreds of Latin names that I'd never remember, you'd never remember, and it's kind of unimportant. And two, there's a tremendous overlap in, in these uh, movement patterns anyways. And I said two reasons, but really it's three. And three, if we're athletes, we're going to train like that athletes, which means we're not going to be doing a lot of isolation exercises like bicep curls. doesn't mean that those are bad, but they're going to be a very small percentage of our training that uh, occurs secondary to uh, big movements that resemble our sport and train, uh, train movement patterns and muscles in a kinetic chain rather than in isolation. And I would say that... Uh, Isolation exercises don't even really exist because even if you're doing a bicep curl, well, you're still using your wrist and your fingers. That's more than one joint, right? So calling it a single joint exercise is not really correct either. I digress. Anyways, so we come uh, come to the first one, which is uh, flexion. Where do you fucking say this? Am I just retarded? Yep, just a little bit retarded. Okay, number two, extension. Extension is just the opposite of flexion. Is instead of bending over, we're extending back, right? However, we don't need to be bent over to initiate extension because if this is neutral, we can still come from there and extend. This is the classic hinge pattern, right? So we think of things like deadlifts and Good mornings with the bar on our back, and even some low bar squats because we're going to be doing a little bit of a hinge. Actually, even the front squat, which is the most upright squat, we will do a little bit of a hinge. Not much, but it still is involved in this motion, right? So we will think about it um, in, in that terms, right? These all, all these exercises will train that, right? In terms of lateral flexion and extension, I only have these as one category. And the reason for that, this is about to be very obvious, is that lateral flexion, it's like a side crunch. You cannot initiate the extension without being already in a flex state. Because if I'm at neutral, well, I'm actually just flexing to the other side, right? So there is no kind of pure extension without the flexion in terms of lateral. Uh, so this is going to be like your side crunches, but also if you were to like pick an impl implement off the ground on the side, like a suitcase de uh, deadlift, or you had a dumbbell or a weight in your hands, right? 
Or even this old school lift called the bent press, where you have uh, in one arm and you bend to the side and push it overhead like this and, and come and return to normal. As you see with all these movements, you either bleed in uh, from one to the other, like how flexion will turn into extension in most uh, athletic contexts, or in terms of something like lateral extension, um, you're going to be doing a little bit of rotation, right? Because it's very hard to stay completely isolated in that one movement pattern. You're going to be either going forward a bit or coming back. So it's essentially impossible to isolate these systems, right? Number four is rotation. Think about the obliques, one of the prime movers, right? For the abs, obviously we're twisting at the hips as well and even the knees and the ankles. But in terms of, of training, anything that rapidly torques our weight is gonna help. We have like the, it's either the Pavlov press or the Pavel press, I'm not sure of the name. It's where we have a cable out here and we resist weight right? We, re we resist the force. Um, we're going to have something called wood choppers, which is like doing motion like this, or we can, we can do it up or we can do it down either one against the, the force on like a cable. We can do, we can also do this, um, with, uh, like a hammer, right? A sledge, a sledgehammer, um, any motion like that. Of course, again, we see that we're going to be doing multiple, um, movements at the same time. We come to the last one, which is circumduction. This is kind of an aggregate of all these movement patterns. Um, the way I like to think about it is sway, circle, chop. And the reason why will become obvious in a second, right? I'm swaying, then I'm going in a circle, and then I'm chopping down, right? Because it's this movement, right? It's a full circle. So Sway, circle, chop, sway, circle, chop, right? That's just how I learned how to remember it, right? And obviously, all these movement patterns are used in boxing. Quite obvious why, but if it's not, I will demonstrate. So when do we actually use these movement systems in boxing, in a boxing context? Well, number one, flexion, right? So that's going to be if we're putting our head forward, which we might do if we're trying to do some kind of counter, like, like a pull counter, right? We're going to stick our head out and then come back. And we bait it, right? We're going to bait the shot, come back, shoulder roll, come back, right? We uh, also do it for any low line head movement, right? If we're bending over forward, especially if we're initiating a clinch situation, we might want to put our head on the outside of his shoulder, right? To uh, <clears throat> stop him from, from hitting us. So we'd be in like this kind of this kind of position, right? Or if we need to get really low and we can't get low enough um, doing our, our standard um, bobs and weaves, we're gonna do some flexion. Of course, regular bobs and weaves, we're gonna be doing a little flexion anyways. Also, if we're, um, at range for something like a like a hook and it's a little bit low for example we might bend this way so that the hook goes over like the back of our neck right those are probably the most common ones um, of course we're also going to use it when we um, do offense like extending our, our jab of course we're pushing our torso out a little bit seems pretty obvious right extension obviously that first part of the pull counter right where we do this, well, when we come back, that's going to be the extension part of it, right? Because like I said, these two things are related. It just depends which one starts first, the concentric versus the eccentric, right? Uh, we're also going to be uh, using extension in uh, quite a bit of defensive movements, right? Obviously, if we just pull back, if we do slips, we might slip um, back into the outside or to the inside, right? Lots of uh, different uses there. When we when we step back, we might, if we're avoiding shots, like we're taking shots, we might have to, you know, something like where we switch switch sides, right? For 
something like that. Lateral flexion. Uh, this is probably best demonstrated by Mike Tyson style slip, right? Because his slip is essentially pure lateral flexion, whereas other slips involve more rotation, especially um, with some flexion, right? Sometimes you slip a little bit forward. Sometimes you slip a little bit back, depending on what's coming at you, right? Of course, uh, lateral flexion is also going to be involved in uh, certain certain offenses, right? Like if you're twisting, if you're doing uh, punching motion, especially because you're bent a bit, there is going to be a little bit of that component. You know, like I said, these systems um, they they bleed into each other, right? Rotation, this is probably the most common one because we use it for everything, right? We use it when we're when we're moving, right? Because our torso is constantly moving and or stabilized by our rotational forces, right? Every offense we are punching rotationally, right? Whether it's a jab or a straight right, whether it's a uppercut, a hook from either side to the body, to the head, all of those use uh, rotation and quite a few defenses, right? Like if we were going to roll the shoulder and if we're going to slip, right? Most slips are not purely one uh, movement pattern, but they're going to involve rotation almost certainly, unless we're basically a complete Mike Tyson style slip. And even that, it's never going to be pure as good as he might have been, right, at the style. Circumduction, um, like I said, this is an aggregate movement of all of these. Um, any any kind of bob and weave is probably the most obvious of that. But again, it's 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 a partial because you're probably not going to be doing this as a as a defensive maneuver, right? Of course, there's also partial movement uh, in offense. Like if I were to be Throwing uppercuts, right? You can see I'm doing that initial part without this part, right? So they all bleed into each other, and uh, yeah, that's that. So why is this actually important? Why why are we having this, you know, advanced anatomy? Uh, learning session about anthropometry and movement systems. Why can't I just have my coach tell me what to do, um, how to train, uh, what exercises to do, when to move, and in which situation boxing? Why do I need to know all this? Well, when you're learning a new skill, it's much more important to know uh, how to think instead of what to think. Because the more you understand how to think, the more you can start incorporating things on your own that lead to your understanding. Give an example, you spend, you know, if, if you uh, train seven days a week, one hour a day, well, there's 23 hours of that day where you're by yourself. What if you had the knowledge of your coach, but in your own body? So you could coach yourself with the same knowledge that a coach does. Wouldn't you have a tremendous uh, advantage there? All this stuff, it l lends itself to all the rest of it, right? It's one piece in a holistic uh, idea, right? And when you start to understand this, you make... You make leaps to other things. You start putting things together that you wouldn't have otherwise, right? Think of an example just off the top of my head, right? All these motion systems are the exact same for the torso as they are for the head, right? Flexion, extension, rotation, lateral flexion, circumduction, right? We understand that uh, boxers that have stronger necks, stronger sternocleidomastoids, and um, trap muscles and the other muscles of the neck, extensors and so on, they have lower incidences of concussion. They get knocked down less, they have less uh, severe outcomes, lower incidence of CTE, right? That's important. So if we know all this, now we all of a sudden, we already know how to train our necks. We, we don't have to spend that entire lesson because we understand, okay, the movement systems are the same, so I just have to find movements that replicate that, that involve, involve the neck, right? There might be an example. Another example, might be um, if we if we understand that guys with long limbs, for example, long legs, they aren't going to be able to squat as much weight because we know that longer levers are uh, just 
in terms of force, it's harder to impart the same force because they're at a greater distance, or right? the balance is not the same either. Um, they have to move the weight a longer distance, and they're less balanced because if you're squat down to the earth, right, it's it's all tight in, right? You don't you, you think about just stick stick your stick your arm out and hold the weight. How hard is that versus holding it here and holding that same weight, right? This is harder. Uh, this is easier to hold the weight than it is out here, right? So you got a really long limbed individual, well, it's going to be really hard for that. So maybe they have really uh, long legs and you automatically know without knowing anything else about them, without ever seeing a punch, that a uh, strategy might involve trying to get them off balance. If, if you're like me, for example, and you're more squat, you're going to want to do um, a punching style that's maybe more pushy rather than uh, like snappy, right? Maybe that's maybe that's something. Uh, there's, there's a million things of this, but you can't come up with those ideas on the fly or integrate them um, without knowing this. You might you might want to know things so that you can think about them at home and then bring those synthesized concepts to your coach and say, hey, I'm on the right track or how can I make this better? Instead of wasting all this time where you have to fill in your coach with metaphors and facsimiles and, and a weak understanding of things because you don't know the terminology for what you're trying to represent, right? You see how 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 this starts to add up over time, uh, makes you makes you a much better, clearer thinker, which, in aggregate, will make you a better boxer. You'll be saving, you know, years off your training time just by understanding this. And this is something that is not understood very well in boxing. The bo uh, classic boxing uh, instruction and sports uh, sports science and strength and conditioning methods are very archaic. They are not up to date with the rest of uh, sports that uh, involve force transmission, uh, rugby, f football, weightlifting, uh, throwing sports, uh, track and field, all of these, they have much better methods of strength and conditioning than boxing does. And a lot of it is based on culture. Um, but there's no excuse for it because you can learn all this stuff online. That's where I learned it. I've never gone to school. I have no degree, but I know all this. I know all this better than a lot of guys that are training people at the gym that I see and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing with your athlete, right? But that's because they're training somebody to keep keep them on a hook to keep bringing them back because that's how they make money. I'm training someone to be self-sufficient so they can leave me, go off and learn the rest of them their own, right? I'm training them how to think so they don't need me. I think that's more ethical. Maybe I don't get as rich. Maybe I give this away for free. But that's how I'd rather learn, isn't it? How you'd rather learn?